<laughs> I got brake forearms too. I know about that. Yeah. I and just don't have brakes on my BMX bike. We're live, Kevin. How's there it going? Go. Good, good. How are you? I am good. A little bit of a quick rush to get in here, but we made it. We're on time and we are good. There you go. Yes. So, how's things going? How's life? We haven't chalked in a bit. Busy. Busy, just like everyone else in the bicycle world these days. Oh, I can't wait to talk with you about this. <laughs> uh, this is a... yeah, doing as much as possible <laughs> with yep. as little time as possible. But what can you do? Yep. Doing as much as you can with as much product as you can. Exactly. <laughs> and... that's, the, that's the tough part right there, balancing it all. Yes. Yeah, so I kind of wanted to start this chat with kind of a recap of our last mm -hmm. one. So do you, like the state of things when we talked last, it was eight months ago. Yep. We talked about how prices needed to go up, talked about how prices were starting to go up, talked about how I think people are still not able to get a lot of stuff. Yeah. At that, at yeah, about eight months ago, it still was super slow. It was still hard. Yeah. And we went in depth about a lot of this stuff. So how's things changed at all since then? Uh, yes and no. I mean, the good thing is for any new purchasing a product, prices have definitely gone down. Container prices have gone down. But the good side of things is I think we'll see a level where some prices stay on the high side. Mm. You know, uh, vendors might decrease prices slightly, but I could see a place where retailers somewhat re somewhat keep the retail level that they had. So that way, some of the margins are actually built back in. Or I would yeah. love to see it go that direction. Yeah. I'm hoping that it goes that direction, you know, so that way all the shops can make more, you know, off the suggested retail as good as it is for prices to be fair for the consumer, I think, you know, there is enough entry level, entry point, low burden purchases out there where it would allow a profile crank to go back. I think when I was a kid, profile cranks were like, they were more than they are now. What? Instead of profile cranks. If, because you'd have Dan's that would have them say for 160, but your local shop, they'd be 189. And how oh, much yeah. are they now? When I worked at staff, I think, a set of profiles with no bottom bracket was 120 and then maybe 160 with an American bottom bracket. Whoa, is that correct? I just... Where are they at? Oh, I want to make sure that's correct. Yeah. Double check it. It's been a long time. Oh, uh, we'll pick 170 right in the middle. Chromoly axle, regular bolts, regular sprocket bolt, and they are 200 bucks. Okay, so yeah, so those are back up. So hopefully those stay up because they should be able to make their money on that. But hopefully the entry level parts will help the higher end parts and the pro signature stuff stay at a higher suggested retail. So that way there is more margins built in for the shops. Yeah, I would. The shops need that margin. They can't. They can't survive on a you know twenty to thirty percent on a fork. That's that's a little insane. You know, when any other industry is easily fifty plus. Yeah. So like outside of the bicycle world, that's kind of where things sit. Yeah, I mean, generally, you're talking if a shop buys a T-shirt for ten dollars or selling it for twenty two ninety five. Oh, you know, okay. So you're generally talking double, and yeah. I would I would say in general in the bicycle industry that's that's generally a safe scenario that's an ideal scenario actually is 50 to 60 percent okay was, yeah not, so, on, not on bikes obviously but you know right yeah one of the things that i talked with some people about too with like how everybody has too much stuff prices oh, have yeah. gone up but mm -hmm. then you run into the problem of well everyone has too much stuff so they start discounting it to get it sold and then what you were talking about with like some things come back down and we're hoping that other things stay up yeah it's a you know it's a bit of a nightmare it's a, it really is exactly like Mo were saying is that there's people with such there's such glutton in bmx in general it doesn't matter who you are right now of product that everyone is forced to put some sort of sale on it 
you know, uh, it, it doesn't matter who you are, you're putting stuff on sale. There's some that are way worse than others. There's, you've mentioned that company frame before who I, I, I believe might be an Australian brand. I think so. Someone was talking, they have a shop or something in Minnesota or something. I don't know. I'm not sure. I mean, I don't hate anybody for being an entrepreneur, but you know, at the same time, you got to respect BMX a little bit and the prices they're selling stuff for it's, it's doing nothing but harming BMX and it's going to harm themselves in the end game. You know, Mm -hmm. some of these brands, like for instance, right now, um, you'll get emails. There's a whole gray market of bike parts, right? Because everyone's got too much stuff. Mm -hmm. I got an email today and it wasn't BMX parts, but there was very high end components on there for mountain and road bikes. And it was an assembler who I don't use saying, I have these parts. Do you want to buy any? And, you know, for instance, there was a mountain bike suspension fork on there that was easily a hundred dollars less than any OEM per- person could buy to an assemble a bike lift. And there was 500 of them. Wow. So say you're somebody, like somebody that owns frame, they could go out and they could buy parts on the gray market and go get them assembled at a cheaper price than a legitimate brand that does stuff in a legitimate way. Mm-hmm. You know, For me, I never buy anything on the gray market at all. But for a brand like frame and you want to make 250 bikes real quick real cheap it makes it real easy and it really devalues bmx as a whole you know i believe that as bmxers it's kind of our duty even though we might love to get a cheap part with a knockoff part it's kind of our duty to support brands that are supporting riders that are supporting events and things like that that's really the that's what keeps things going Mm -hmm. you know you can't you can't just, you know, if Haro went and fired all their riders and had no riders and supported absolutely nothing, I wouldn't be there. Yeah. Either, because it's just not, the longevity of it's not there at all. Or the integrity. So, it, or the integrity, you know. So, and the, the thing that really bothers me the most about a brand like Frame, and I don't know who it is, so sorry if that person's a good person, but at the end of the day, that kid that's buying that $250 three-piece crank bike that bike doesn't have, if you look at the geometry on some of them, they're, they're way off. So it's not even going to be more talked about creating a good experience. I mm. think that that's extremely intelligent of them. That is a smart thing. You want, even when a kid buys an aluminum RO shredder, like that shouldn't even really be jumped off a curb. I still want them to have fun on it in hopes that they buy a $500 Haro down the road and that they get into BMX or at least into bike riding. But those cheap bikes, it's the same as a toy store bike, right? You buy it the fork and the headsets on backwards or whatever it is. And then, you know, you get clowned when you go to the skate park and you never go back to the skate park. And there you go. BMX lost somebody that might've been the next Garrett Burns. Yeah. You know? Oh, absolutely, man. And, uh, the other thing about framed specifically is that their ads literally say like, something about being cheaper than other bmx it's like bmx yeah. but cheaper it was I like think, you know it's 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 ironic because i think there's another uk brand um that does a lot of d2c stuff it's not somebody that you or me would have friends that ride for necessarily or anything but they literally did an instagram ad that was somebody from the company walking through their full warehouse bragging on how it's so good because now they have bikes so cheap and you're like that's the the, the, it's awesome that you're showed your deck of cards that you have too many bikes but at the same time that's not good because you're devaluing bmx and you know that company won't be here in the long term i'm sure they'll be gone the next five years you know unless they stick it out you know but it's seeing stuff like that i think you know it reminds me of the fact that as people in anybody in the BMX industry or anybody who's a BMXer at all, even from a kid that's only been riding for three months, it's important that we all support each other. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a BMX in the grand scheme of things. When you look at it, the size of the BMX industry, the quote unquote or BMX lifestyle, however you want to put it, it's not that big. 
So if we're all fighting over the same $25 t-shirt sale, the same $10 wax, well, we also got to worry about growing the pie for everybody. Yeah. I think that sometimes, personally, I think, and this is all of us are guilty of this within BMX, we're too, sometimes we're too out for ourselves rather than thinking, is this good for BMX? If it's good for BMX, don't worry about making a dollar more than the person next to you. Just do it because at the end of the day, what's good for BMX is going to come back to you. Yep. You know, so it's, it's, uh, yeah, those things, there's, you know, there's companies like framed and some of the other ones out there doing it, you know, they definitely bother, bother me because, you know, they don't, they don't really support what's been put in place by everybody prior to us. Right. Yeah, it's like it's almost like there's the BMX industry that is the pie that everyone talks about. Yep. And then there's like outside of that the the framed the companies like framed and whatever and yep. they're they're taking money out of BMX industry that would have been there because people would have been buying industry like core companies exactly. and putting it into this other pie and not putting any of anything back into at this all. this one at all and what kind of bummed me out the most about that whole entire thing is that you had people in the comments this was a facebook ad that i saw you have people in yeah. the comments saying i'm on my third framed and it's such a great bike i'm like what what you're on your third one and it's great like if i gotta be honest with you so say say i make 500 of one bike mm-hmm. if three of those broke i'd be really pissed off yeah. Three out of the five hundred, and we're talking like an OEM bike. Yeah. I would be, I would be in the drawing, adjusting, making that bike heavier, or adjusting something about it, so it didn't happen again. Yeah, you man. know. So it's my. I don't want to warranty stuff. You know. In fact, like at Haro, there's some shit they warranty where I'm like, you literally just sent that kid new pedals. They were bent, and the, the kid look at the bottom of the pedal. They did tell me pedal grinds they do, but it's like, nope. Take care of them. Take care of them. And it's admirable to do that, you know. Mm -hmm. But it's just funny that these companies that, like you said, somebody's mindset would be like that. Yeah, it's so strange. And there was other people that were just praising them in the comments. And it made me wonder almost if it was like fake comments on this post because they knew it was an advertising thing and they paid like bots or whatever it would be to go in and give positive interaction in there. I've thought about that too. The other one I've noticed too is like, I forget what it was. I, I think I left a bad comment or something like that on a product once on Instagram, Mm -hmm. not bike related. And the company reached out and gave me a discount code. So I thought about that. I'm like, well, that's nice of the company to spend the time to do that. But I wonder if it's a known thing, like, Hey, if you praise them or talk shit, they'll give you a code. So it could be a scenario like that as well. Yeah, man. Now, when it's somebody personally reaching out to a consumer and saying, I'm sorry about your experience. If you need anything else, here's a discount code. That's one thing. In that frames case, I doubt that's the scenario. Mm-hmm. You know, I would be suspicious of it as well. <sighs> but, you know, it's it's interesting because it's not just that brand. There's other brands. Moeller mentioned all. Uh, he pretty much mentioned all the names. And you come to find out, you're like, well, the owner of that company doesn't even ride bikes. They're not. They're from you're literally from the clothing industry. You mm. just happened to like a fixed gear bike and you started there. Then you started copying colors and making BMX bikes. It, it just, that's what bums me out because then there's shops that buy into that, right? The shops are just looking at the spec and even a shop that's bringing those bikes in to them, the spec looks good. And some of those shops, aren't BMX core shops where they really don't necessarily understand it. They just see it's chromoly with sealed bearings and three piece cranks. This Mm -hmm. is going to sell. Then little Johnny comes in and they're out of whatever bike brand he might know, but they have that one and the owner tells them, Oh, this is a better bike for the price. It's the same color and they buy it, you know? So it does it, it, a bit of it falls on the entire sales channel altogether, you know? And, and us as BMX riders or people that work in the industry, whatever it is, is educating our local shops. Yeah. And also speaking to our local shops and telling them what we might want. You know, oftentimes we're so busy going to mail orders, which 
I don't have any problems with mail orders. I ran staff BMX for years. And so I have no problem with that. But the thing is, is that if you're not calling the local shop to at least check to see if they have something first, they're never going to order it. Right. You know, they're 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 going to think there's no BMX scene around them because to them there is, there might not be one unless they have an employee that rides BMX. Yeah, there's. I mean, I would think it's not too far fetched to say that there's a lot of shops out there that have zero interaction with anyone local who rides, and nobody yeah. who rides BMX is in there working, so they have, and and they might not know themselves, so they don't even know any better. No. And it's a bit intimidating, right? Like it can be because we're, we're as BMXers, all of us as a group collectively and the industry, we're real good at like going like this, right? Like this is ours. We can't share it. Mm -hmm. You don't want, and it's a balance. You don't want to overshare to make it corny and horrible. But at the same time, if you, if you're not willing to share it and try to grow it, then don't expect to ever make money doing it. Don't, don't expect to ever make more money doing it at all you know so it's i think my biggest thing lately it's like it's hard not to stress about the product and the glutton of it and price is this and price is that and it, but it's like i just think we need to get back to supporting each other and doing jams together yeah man no I... matter who it is we're all in it for the same you know like there might be people that each of us don't love in bmx but at the same day we all have the end the, we all have the same goal at the end is to, you know, hopefully grow BMX and, you know, see a new kid at the skate park ripping it up. You know, we want to have fun doing it and see it grow. Yeah. So I think, you know, it's tough, especially when there's no money. You know, I would love to throw an event at Haro myself and the owners are down to do it. But it's like, how do you come up with real money to build a, some form of legitimate ramps and give a legitimate prize purse? You know, I don't want to give somebody that wins a pro street jam or contest $250. Like that's, it probably in California, it might've cost them that much in fucking gas and lunch to get there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, so how do you think we get out of the current situations that we're in? Honestly, I, all we, you know, not all we can do is sit back and wait, but I mean, I've looked at like, you know, if somebody, if I'm talking to so-and-so and they're like, Oh, I have X amount of bikes. And, you know, we're, we're not sharing information, but we're just talking. Mm -hmm. You start putting the big picture together, even with the even with the seat issue, you start putting how many seats does BMX all together own? Yeah. All around the world. I think most BMXers only think about what is sitting in the U.S. That's not the re what's in the U.S. and what's in people's buildings doesn't even that's nothing. So think about how many seats there is. Just take the pivotal seat. How many pivotal seats is there in the world? And then you can estimate, you know, there's people that do these stupid reports and act normally they're not that accurate, but there's they're at least a guideline and a reference of how many BMX bikes sell or this sells. You take a number that you assume, you know, say, you know, how you have a general number, of how many BMX bikes sold deduct those pivotal seats. How many pivotal seats do you think, you know, sell aftermarket deduct that number and you start deducting and looking at the runtime of just pivotal seats in BMX, right? To me, you end up in the middle of 2024, back to normal, nor either not at Haro, but in general, you mm -hmm. either end up with a period where you're gonna start buying again, or you're under your normal inventory level. You know, because it's a tough scenario. So what happens, and I don't know, I mean, I definitely listen to all mowers and other people, you know, who you've had on, but I don't know if anybody's talked about it, but you know what happens is that we've all got orders in the system, right? Mm -hmm. Say we've all got all these pivotal seats. We're all yelling at the same factory. Right, because one factory makes all yeah. of them. And bless their heart, they make amazing products. Like no issue with that, the quality's good. Yeah, absolutely. So we're all busy yelling at them. After a year and a half, somebody there finally gets tired of it and says, so, in the, in the bicycle industry, a pivotal seat is the easiest thing to make. It's hand-stitched. Mm. So at the end of it all, they get tired. They say, well, it's hand-stitched seat. I just hire more people. All of a sudden, orders like, you know, for Haro and anyone else probably runs their business the same way. They might put in orders for a year, but they're staggered out, right? Yeah, they're yeah. Right? 
separate POs, all of a sudden everything's ready all at once. Oh no. And to that person, they just got busy being yelled at for over a year and a half, two years about this. To them, they think they're doing a service. What they're doing is, is they really hurt everybody. Yeah. Un- unintentionally, their, their intent was to help everybody. Unintentionally, it creates a little bit of a backlash now where we all have too many seats. You know, I mean, I've got enough seats that I'm specking pivotal seats on lower end bikes for the next year. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's just the nature of it. It's like you look at this inventory and you're like, this is all just sitting here. Where can I use it? Other than selling it aftermarket, because aftermarket sales, you know, you have the raising interest rates and all that going on as well. So it compiles on. Mm -hmm. Right. So people are going to spend naturally a little less money right now, obviously, and everything's on sale. So you're going to have people start specking those on lower end bikes, which will be good for the consumer. But it's going to take time to run out of them. And, you know, so you've got that problem. But the other problem that you have and, you know, I'll I'll gladly pinpoint Trek on this one. But you've got people like Trek who I mean, the numbers that they do are absolutely disgusting. They literally during COVID took control of assemblers where other brands, large brands were supposed to be assembled. All of a sudden their parts disappeared. I heard about this, you know, and you have to remember they might not make a BMX bike, but do they use a 25.4 seat post? Yes. Do they use a BMX style pedal? Yes. So you've got the big boys, Trek, Giant. I don't, I don't know about Specialized. I'm assuming so. Where they demanded factory space, they demanded these products. And even if we'll use a mountain bike scenario, say I'm trying to get a certain Shimano shifter. I already ordered it. Shimano says it's at that factory. Then you check with that factory, and they're like, "No, it's not here. We never got it." And you're like, "Yeah, you did. You got it." It showed up. Okay, I get it. It's not there. I'm screwed. What do I do? Nothing. Yeah. So the same scenario happens when, you know, it's business wise, they would refer to, to the bullwhip concept where it, it's all going to come back, right? If it's mm. going to spike, it's coming back. So now it's all coming back. So Trek says, I don't want any of that. Cancel it all. And if you don't cancel it, I'll go find somebody else. Yep. So that's where you get scenarios with, like I was talking about with the gray market, where you'll get a random vendor reach out and say, I have all these parts. Are you interested in any of them? I'll give you five or 10% off. So that's what you're occurring with now is that, I mean, I'm sure there's factories sitting on enough tires to last four years. You know, you're sitting on things like that where it's, you know, there's just an over glutton of even parts all over the place that's so crazy so i mean you mentioned putting these seats on lower spec bikes do you Mm -hmm. see this affecting 2024 model bikes in any other ways where like companies because they have so many bikes already like they make other decisions about 2024 i mean it's a tough one right because it's like uh what i what i did is that my 22s because of delays got adjusted a little bit and became 23s yeah because to me that was the only smart thing to do Mm -hmm. it had the it had the numbers and quantities had to come back down there was no way around it there was a day when you at haro you could literally just walk through whatever you wanted to in the warehouse there was no bikes yeah Like there there was bikes being sold that out of our warranty department where warranty might have taken the bike apart and just taken cranks off of it. People were buying those bikes. Wow. You know, and now, I mean, the warehouse is full. No one's going to tell you otherwise. The warehouse is full. You know, you go out for a ride and you come back in and you have to go around boxes now, whereas before you just beelined it back into work. Um, Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, it's going to affect it. I think what's going to happen is you're going to see a delay by a lot of people. I don't think people have a choice. Right. You know, I mean, right now, a scenario that Haro was in, we got a little bit lucky in BMX above a certain price point where we were we were able to cancel some orders in time where it didn't affect inventory. 
Okay. Which was nice. So some of the higher end models were not necessarily overstocked on, but the problem you might we might have is that, say we normally sell X amount of a, a higher end bike. Well, there's also a million of those everywhere. So we're gonna sell a little less. Yeah. You know? And the, the industry is slow in general, so you're gonna sell less. So you still do have the glutton of bikes. You just don't have as much in some scenarios. That makes sense. And and so that brings up my next thought is wondering if year model bikes even make sense anymore to where do we do a new bike style every single year and we try to whatever. Or like mm-hmm. some companies have waited until there's enough of an upgrade for a bike to give it a new run down and then maybe just change colors here and there yeah actually you know what i actually really credit um i don't know who did it at sunday back in the day i'm assuming it was nuno um that was doing this but one thing they did that i always thought was really cool is and i'm starting to do this at haro is say they the a bike's going to come in two colors mm-hmm. well they probably already had sampled a third color. So when one of those colors starts getting slow, they can just all of a sudden have, oh, this bike's available in yellow now. Uh, so it never gets fully stale. And I always thought that that was a smart process. Yeah. And that's something that I'm going to be doing with our with what I would call MY24, even though it might not be a model year thing. But what, what I'm going to do is some bikes that I don't be, I believe that all of us, we all of our lines are kind of fat, right? We're mm-hmm. all like the Blueberry Girl and Willy Wonka. We're <laughs> like, oh, well, we need a bike with just two sticks of chromoly. It should be fifty dollars more. Yeah, it, it it's a bit silly, right? What's two sticks of chromoly really going to do for you? At the grand scheme of things, mm-hmm. unless it's your head tube, bottom bracket, and drop out, it's not going to do a lot. Um, so a lot of what I'll do is there were some bikes where we did have three colors, and I already sampled them. So I might not order that third color right away, but later down the road, if our sales manager says, hey, like this Haro Lucadia, sales are getting a little slow, you know, it's our bread and butter bike, like what do you think we can do? It's like, oh, well, remember we also had this color. We could start selling, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think you will, as far as model years go, you're gonna see people mixing it up. And I think because of the way everything lined up, you're gonna see people where their MY2324, say they sell out of a certain model, well, they might not bring more of that model year and they might just bring the new model in. Mm-hmm. So what I what I did, and I think, I'd assume some people are doing, is Haro is still operating or somewhat respecting a model year, right? Because yeah. it, it's so, ever, I mean, I've been in the industry yeah, 24 years. So well, from the time of working at a bike shop. So to me, it's so beaten in my head that it has to be a model year, even though I don't want it personally to be. Mm-hmm. Got to have the framework and the infrastructure and the planning, you know, to change as well behind the scenes. Yeah. So lots of times I still completely refer to model year, whereas you know, for instance, there's one model right now where there's a new colorway and a few frame upgrades already done and the sample's done. Well, I know what that bike should sell. So when it sells, starts to sell close to that quantity, we'll stop ordering it and re- renew and, and we will introduce the new model. Yeah. So rather than things like you said, things running on a model year like we have to be the that that's another big thing we all did in the bike industry right who can put out the newest model the newest model year the fastest mm, that's like the car industry you know it's a fucking bmx bike like yeah. they've all been 25 <laughs> nine for how long right like they're, it's not we're not they're not rockets here you know unless you're doing unless it's real high-end stuff and pna and aftermarket stuff there's not a lot of stuff changing year to year not drastic anyway so What I do now is lots of our bikes are, some bikes are set purely for rollover. Like we make the Haro Shredder, which is our little kid's sidewalk bike. That's a rollover bike. Mm -hmm. But what am I gonna change on that year over year? Slight graphics here, this or that. So on a bike like that, that same colors might be available for two years now. 
Yep. You know, there'll be some models that are just always cons consistent, you know, but yeah, we've started doing the non model year now, just not really. I don't think we fully have advertised it. I'm not sure how they deal with that in a sales situation, but we had a big wheel bike with uh, Pete, uh, Pistol Pete, an old school racer. Okay. And um, long story short, there was an old Haro Group One colorway that. I wanted when I was a kid, so I pulled a John Bulgens and selfishly was like, I want to change <laughs> it back to the group one. Let's do this. And he was there at the time, and he agreed. So what happened this year was this pistol bike was so delayed, and we had ran the same stickers for a few years, that we just made a call. Sales made a call and said, screw it. We're going to order this group one. It's the same bike, same spec, different name and paint job. Right. You know, so I think you will run into some of that. And that, that to me, is another thing. I've looked at doing where it's like, what about completely repainting and graphicking the same bike? Yeah. You know, because for an assembly factory, there's already painters there for them to strip and repaint a frame. It's a day's work. It's not. And they're still making money doing it. They charge you for paint anyway. So they'll happily do that for you. That's an interesting thought too. In that, like, yeah, what we're saying, like, how much are you going to improve a bike each year? So maybe yep. people start doing like super creative models of like paint and or graphics. Colors. Exactly. Yeah. You know? So, I mean, I've I've kind of been trying to look outside the box, outside the box with it a little bit towards the apparel industry where it's like it's a quicker colorway turn, right? Like mm -hmm. everything's like, oh, we sold out. We're glad we sold out. Move on, move on, move on. You don't want to do that with everything because you don't build longevity necessarily with that, but you definitely keep people interested. So I think, you know, there's some interesting collab models that I'm going to be doing and those will be acting as that where, you know, one collab uses the same spec as Chad Curley's big wheel and it's a brand that's close to him. Yeah. But that's going to be a quick, we're only making 100. I don't want to make, I'm doing this as to keep people interesting and a marketing piece. I'm not doing this to see everybody riding the same bike. Dude, I think my, that might be onto something too because that gives opportunity for the riders to get even more involved and be like, oh, we're doing this quick run. Like, yeah, draw, exactly. you know, you make. And it's nothing, you know, it's nothing new. Right. No, that's another molar scenario where or not really molar, but anybody who is in the USA, right? Like uh, Moore did that frame for Doyle and everyone thought it was a signature Doyle. It's like, no, he just did some quick runoff of stickers and paint, you mm -hmm. know, or profile did. Uh, I don't know. I think it was a Mike's. They'll do like they did a custom Mike's of Vader colorway in different colorways. It's like, no, they just they can act quick, quicker than the rest of us who deal with Taiwan. Yeah, which is a huge advantage to them. So my thought process is, well, what if I plan far enough ahead that I can act, I can appear to act as quick. Right. Yeah. You know, the whole profile thing is like, it's awesome that they do that. And I think they're creating even more demand. And then like an after after market where people are like, I need the galaxy rust. I'm willing to pay yep. $800 because somebody else still has a brand new set in the box. Yep. And people do that. When I was at staff, we, there was actually an employee at staff who is a super nice, super nice dude. And I know he's still, he's on Scotty's Kramer's channel all the time, that dude, Brooklyn. But anyway, he's a profile whore <laughs> and he knows it. Every color that comes out, he buys the hub shells. Nice. Matt Copeland would even laugh. Like he knew who they were for. Mm -hmm. Cause it's like, make sure you order me the anodized brown. It's like, the blue's a month old, dude. What are you doing? You don't how <laughs> you know. Yeah. So people do like that stuff and I mean, all for the best, right? You know? Yeah. Let them like it. It's and a good thing. If that gets created, I mean, you look at I wonder if that's how the the Aaron Ross bikes got so big. What, the colorways? The cream soda and the grape soda, like Aaron's just Aaron's just really, really smart in general. And, and with marketing stuff, I think, you know, when you put, like, I spent a lot of time with Aaron on the road for Etnies. Mm -hmm. And I would always think, like, he's one of those riders and humans. Like, his guard is fully down all the time. So he's always open to ideas. Oh, okay. You know, and his sense of, like, 
you know, yeah, he has his own fashion and style, but I think he's open to anything. So I think with him, like the cream soda one, knowing him, you know, knowing what I do know of him, he probably was at Seven Eleven and saw a cream soda and was like, I want that color bike. It's real <laughs> loud and it'll stand out and I'll do this ad with it, right? Because mm-hmm. they did like the pizza, I think they did a pizza ad with one color away. They did the cream so- soda color ad. Like he was really good at whatever product he put out he was coming up with a concept to market it alongside. Yeah. Oh, the cream soda ad is sick. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, Devin Hutchins shot that. It looks. It's one of the best BMX ads. It, all the the so Sunday bottles and cans. Yeah. That is. So you know, sick. I shot a one of the. I shot a bike check with him for Dig years ago, and I've never like seen a rider so dedicated to make the picture different you know he's just like let me just throw my bike in the air ahead of me but i need above me but i want it to be perfect like it would be on the ground Mm -hmm. it probably took an hour to get that photo yeah he's always doing a bike check takes 15 minutes you know because he knew well if i post that picture someone's just going to see a bike floating against a wall and be like what the hell and they're going to click on it so I think Aaron is just, I mean, I know he is. He's good at marketing himself and he's open to ideas. And that, I mean, that's part of why he was successful in BMX. That's why he still is. And I'm sure that's why he's successful in the housing business and, you know, renovations and Airbnb stuff he does now. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. Yeah. Uh, So in talking about like the creativity aspect of these kinds of things like what do you think is going to dictate whether or not a company like continues to be successful through this like tough period this is the part that really sucks to say but and i'm blessed because haro has financial you know financial backing it's a bigger company and you know the owner is willing to put up their own money not in their pocket and not out of a bank so that's very good but i it's going to take people that have the financial backing or the ingenuity to try different products yeah you know look at robbie at colt um i'm not sure it's robbie or somebody else over there but they're real smart about constantly having like different little valve caps or different cool little things yeah they're doing a lot that stuff like you go to buy something like there's stuff that Robbie posts where I'm like, man, I need to hit Robbie up. I just want that valve cap you <laughs> yeah. my, or like I need to buy this. But there's stuff that like I see them doing and other people doing where it's like, man, that's pretty cool that they're doing that. Like he just came, I saw an ad today for a jacket that was 70 bucks. And I'm like, I'm going to buy like when I get paid next week, I'm going to buy one and support Robbie. Like it's a cool that he's doing this more expensive jacket i'm sure he's not doing a ton of them mm-hmm. but it draws attention and it draws people to the website yeah. by doing those things you know so i think people are going to have to think out of the box and or they're going to have to have the money to sit you know they have to be able to afford to sit on the product right the warehousing is not cheap yeah there's that line between how much do you discount how much do you sit on and how much can you afford to sit on yeah i mean and that's the whole thing i mean it's you have to look at it that every space when you're when you're in on the logistical side of a warehouse every space really matters right that top right hand corner of the warehouse you can put a box there Mm -hmm. and you should (laughs) you want the warehouse full you just want it You want whatever you have in the warehouse going out and coming back in constantly. That's and right now everything's just sitting. But yeah, it really is. When do you discount? When's the right time? When's not the right time? Once one person jumps in, we none of us have a choice, right? Yeah. I mean, there was some gouging of discounts going on or still going on by certain people. And I know and I would assume that that was financial driven, right? Business is business. So I don't personally hate that. I don't personally like that they did that, but I don't hate them for doing it. Because at the same time, some of my friends work for, for, you know, uh, people that we all love work for these companies and they need to do it to keep the company afloat. Right. So we can't necessarily get mad at everybody for discounting. But what I would hope everybody's doing is 
at least having the balls to sit on as much inventory as they can for as long as they can. Right, yeah, because it, it could happen real quick where any of those price increases that we talked about that BMX needed to have yeah. done could just all just disappear overnight because too many companies jump onto it and then like how do you how do you raise that back up just be like all right we're okay now guys guess what everything's going back up 150 bucks for a frame exactly and some of it it really has to do with cash flow issues right yeah that's what it ends up being like when you see a brand no matter what they are clothing brand shoe brand whatever it is if there's constantly sales on their website of over like 10 10 20 percent that company has cash flow issues they're getting their product in and then they spent all their money buying what they ordered so they don't have money to pay the guys in the warehouse or whoever it is. Mm-hmm. It's not – it's a revolving door, you know. So I'm definitely thankful for one that our sales department decided they don't necessarily want to go out with huge discounts and they would discount as they saw need be. Now I can say that's now we definitely have discounted certain ones, but there's no gross across the board – all my 22s are 30 percent off there's none of that shit Mm -hmm. there might be like this one model is actually 20 percent cheaper to the dealer but the msrp is only 10 percent deeper so really what we're doing and one thing that you know i think a lot of bmx companies could do to help the dealer is increase the dealer's margin by giving them the discount but don't always expect them to show that discount to the um to the consumer, you know, if a dealer is getting 20% off, but the manufacturer suggested retail price is only 10% off. Well, what that means is that that dealer that is now hurting to keep their doors open made a little extra margin. Right. Yeah. So I think that's important, you know, and it's just, I don't know. It's time to stop fighting the fucking prices. <laughs> like, <laughs> it is what it is. If it's, you know, it's, it's like, just be as competitive as you can be. And, you know, I look at spec and I'm like, this is what it should be, period. Mm -hmm. And then I sort out the mess of figuring out the price down the road because it. So how do we educate the public and people so that they understand why this stuff needs to happen and why it's happening? Like, I feel like if you just hit them with an increase, it's like yeah. sticker shock and people won't fully understand, but I, I feel like there well, has to be a way. And that's the, I mean, BMX has a, in general got themselves in this situation because it was a race to the bottom price. Yeah, you exactly. Know, there was days where there was like coupon wars online, mm-hmm. like back in the early days of online vital and, you know, B- and uh, ride BMX websites. Like I remember working at staff and literally seeing and I'm not hating on Dan's at all. They have totally different it's owners. It's the old Dan's. Totally doesn't business matter. Now, you know, like I have absolutely, this is not a negative statement towards their current situation. But I remember being like, they put 25% off and then literally getting a text from the owner of staff like, fuck, I don't want to do it, but just do 30 just for the hell of it. Just put it up for a couple hours just yeah. to fuck them. And you'd look at the discount code and it would say like, F off Dan would be the def- discount code. Oh, like it wow. was blatant. And it just got to the point where it's like, why are we doing this? Yeah. And at one point, I think like after a month of doing that, we're just like, this is, there's no reason for it. So BMX raced itself to the bottom, but we can't race ourselves to the highest dollar or else we're going to lose the consumer. Right, exactly. So it is a very, it's a very gradual thing that we have to do. Yeah. You know, so it's definitely, and everybody's in their own scenario. They really, and, and it's unfortunate to say that because it's just the nature of doing business, right? Um, Haro probably does more, we buy more brakes than company X. Well, or then, or say we, say we buy more generic 990 brakes than other BMX companies, mm-hmm. or we buy more brakes from that company. Well, we buy a shitload more brakes from that company because I'm buying brakes for mountain bikes, kids' bikes, race bikes, uh, gravel road bikes, you know? Mm -hmm. So when I go to that company and I'm like, I want to spec this 990, this 990 style brake, and they give me a price, well, I'm going to go back to them and say, 
no, 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 no. Like you answered too fast. Like I know that's not the real price you're going to give me. Look at how much I do with all these other bikes. So everybody is in a different scenario in that standpoint, you know, where different people are getting different prices. So it's, it, everyone's got to evaluate it for themselves and, and gradually increase together. Hopefully is what we're going to do. You know, so, I, it's not ideal and it I know it's actually can be in a way illegal for company owners to speak together and work the industry in a certain way. But I would love to see a day where we all sit in a room and just talk about what can we all do for BMX? Not mm-hmm. not what are we going to do to raise prices necessarily, but a, a good college debate, kind of like we're having now or you had with Moeller and other people where you talk about these problems, where you talk about, hey, the Trek stores, now that they don't have Mirko, now that Trek's done trying to buy other BMX companies, uh, what are we going to do to try to explain to them that they should carry a form of BMX? Because right now, they probably don't think they need to. Mm-hmm. You know, they're not seeing the demand because, again, we're just leaving that shop. We're not calling them and asking them for ODI long necks. We just said screw it and bought them online. Right, right. You know, um, so I think really a day needs to come where everybody needs to sit down, the riders, different people in general need to sit down and just debate what all can we do to put more profit back into BMX to be able to grow it for everybody. Because if there's more profit back in BMX, I'm not talking about me making more money or anything like that or companies making more money. In, but in general, if there's more profit, riders, companies, everybody will be able to do more events yep. and the general public will be able to see them and the events we'll be able to do will be that much more amazing. You know, I, I hate I, saying it, but if you watch uh, the downhill street mountain bike shit that they do in Mexico and Colombia, that's a cool, that's a cool event for the naked eye to watch. It stops you and makes you want to watch it. Some BMX events, because the funding's not there, aren't always the coolest event to watch. Yeah, yeah. So I think we need to think about that, right? Like, we all know the Circle of Balance was amazing to watch because it's more personal. Well, I know a filmer that had a great idea, but probably won't get the, the funding for it, where it's like, you could do a flat rail contest in a brewery just like that. Hey, and source. It would, be really, <laughs> it would be really cool. So that's Tony Ennis. Somebody give Tony Ennis a shitload of money so he can pay the riders right to do this. But that would be a really cool contest. You could have all sorts of people riding it. You know, from somebody like Albert Mercado, who's got a crazy different style and way of looking at something, all the way to somebody like Garrett that's going to do something that you're like, I don't know what that trick's called, but that (laughs) no one's done that. (laughs) You know? Listen, Source, you need to get a hold of Tony Ennis. (laughs) <laughs> do know. it at the Kentucky Source Warehouse. Pay him for the idea. Let's make well, this happen. Well, see, that's happen. the thing is you can't do it at a warehouse. That's what I'm realizing. Oh, you it's got to be Because public. like I said, I'd love to do something at Haro. Well, we have a company store at Haro. So if we did something at Haro, I would have to lock the building up. Oh, yeah. And I would do that because I'd want like Robbie and people and anybody from Southern California, bike shops, come up and set up an easy up and sell shit. Yeah. Like make some money. You know, Um, so that's the that's the tough thing, right, is everybody needs to make a little money. So you everyone's got to learn to be unselfish and be like, we're all going to support this and do it here. Yeah, that makes total sense. And I think you hit on why having these discussions is so important, because I think having outward public facing discussions where we talk about these things so that the general BMX population can hear them is how we educate people and and how they can understand why that frame might cost them five hundred fifty dollars now because i don't know that everybody realizes where that money is actually going yeah i mean it's an it's i mean i'd love to be transparent about it i mean maybe we can do one one day where i actually show you where that money goes to because (laughs) if you look at like if you saw the invoice I just got for testing complete bikes, you'd shit yourself. Yeah. Well, I didn't mean necessarily to the company. I just meant like, where... no, that's 
that's what I'm saying in general, though. Like, how does a frame that starts out at this material cost, this minute little cost, if on, on a frame, how does it end up being that much more than what the small cost is? Where does it go? You know, yeah. it, you're right. It's interesting because you're like, well, the company's actually making the smallest margin. Everyone would be lying if they said the rider really sh probably should make more money mm -hmm. in a perfect world. Um, you know, off of a frame, you know, and then it's like, then a company's got to test, you know, I know the frame's not going to break. Like anybody that's been making frames long enough knows what thickness to make the frames at this point. Mm -hmm. It's not, but if you don't have that legal document, it does matter. Okay. You know, and especially you deal with, when you're dealing with complete bikes, you deal with a lot of other shit too. Like they literally have to test the paint to make sure a baby can eat it. Oh my gosh. So that's what I was going to ask is like, what exactly is being tested or what are they like? Is it an outside Everything. thing? So that... there's, yeah, there's third party testing. Okay. And those companies aren't, those companies aren't out to get us. Right. It's just, yeah. you have the CPS SC, right. And you have CPS CIA, which is another form of testing, which tests chemicals to make sure they're safe for kids. Like, Say I spec a brake cable that doesn't, isn't safe for a kid to bite, mm -hmm. the material on it, that could be a lawsuit. Yeah. So it's like you even end up, that's another thing. I hope like a company like Frame doesn't know about this because that's <laughs> the thing is like we're all buying more expensive brake cables than we really have to because of some weird legality shit. Yeah. You know, I'm, I mean, I'm going to have a kid sometime in the next 10 days and if my kid bites a down tube, and get sick from the paint, I'm not going to sue anybody, but there's people out there that will. And there's kids out there, apparently, that will do this. Yeah. You know? but, so you end up paying all these absorbent testing fees for complete bikes, and then you have to do ISO testing, which it's actually not a film speed. Oh, ISO okay. It's actually <laughs> yeah. international standards. So you have to do ISO testing on literally every single frame, fork, handlebars, almost everything, you know? Um, and that it's, it's not cheap. It's easy to pass, but it's not cheap. It's almost like they should just be cutting the frame in half and measuring to make sure tubing's thick enough. But, you know, so all those little costs do add up. Well, and the other aspect of it is that like, I just don't, in our daily lives, I feel like most people don't think about everything that it takes to make something. I mean, you could compare anything, this mouse. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the amount of different parts that are in this mouse that get sourced from different things, and then they have to make it, and you're paying, I mean, on a complete bike, how many different pieces would you guess that have to be paid for to build that bike? That had to be paid for? It's got to be a lot, a big number. I'll tell you, hold on. Okay. I'm curious because, I mean, you think about it, between bearings, tires, tubes, rims, spokes, hubs, frame, all of it. It's, it's like, yeah, it's like, breaking oh, sorry. Down. Oh, you're okay. I'm curious. I'm curious. Cause I'm like, Oh, well I can actually just look at a spec sheet and tell you how many lines there is on it, you oh, know? Yeah. And that doesn't even break down like the fact that there's two reflectors on there. You know, that just, there's a line for both res reflectors, but I'm just kind of curious, you know, now that you asked it, I was like, I have it here. I should just look. I want to guess, I'm going to say it's between 75 and a hundred different pieces that make up a complete bike that have to be. Assembled. It's not that, it's not that bad. Well, see spokes, do you count? You don't count 36. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Like rims are all on the same line, but. I have 59 lines in my spec and that doesn't include things like owner's manual spec packaging mm -hmm. stick, you know, it, it has a sticker on there, but just one sticker, you know? So yeah, it's a lot. And you know, you have to take into consideration that that's, you know, cranks alone. When you go to do that, that's like five lines. Cause you're talking all the different parts. Right. Exactly. And then like a hub, a hub, like a rear hub, is yeah. not just a rear hub it's the shell the bearings the ratchet ring and all of the parts that make up the driver like there's a lot to it well and then you're dealing with you know material sizing too right 
So like one thing, I not that I would ne I would never think about this because I never had the issue at all. So when we went to do Chad's new stem for premium that's coming out in a few months, it literally has been done for a year and a half. But the whole issue is is that the width that I wanted the face plate to be at because I wanted it two millimeters wider. Oh, you told me about this, yeah. For me to get that CNC block, I had to wait for them to get it. And I, I could have changed vendors, right? I could have mm. went to a different vendor who could have gotten it a few months faster, but I'm not gonna do that. Every stem I've ever made for the past 15 years has been with one person. Mm. Why would I go change? I know they do it right. So, you know, you run into these real weird issues or like sub 22.2 diameter tubing is hard to get. Well, that's the entire rear end of a BMX bike. There you go. But you can get it out of Japan for a higher price a little bit faster. So it's like, there you go. You're adding price to it, you know? Yep. And then uh, another thing that I feel like can't be reiterated enough is that that the cost that is reflected at the final end from the cost that goes up for the producer of that part is it's why you see things higher is because it costs it just costs more to make the thing yeah exactly but i mean it's 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 a tough one you know because you just i always go back to like what can we do to fix it or what do we have to do and it's three things we have to sell off the inventory that's in the u.s mm. we have to sell off whatever's sitting in factories you know i mean there's 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 companies that there's bmx companies that not a lot that just left had to up and leave a factory because they couldn't take an order because the or because of the situations so then all of a sudden well like you said all those hubs are sitting there mm -hmm. all the it still has to go somewhere it doesn't just evaporate yeah like you know china might not be the number one place for you know it might be one of the worst places for pollution but they're not throwing bicycle hubs in the fucking river anymore so <laughs> it, it, you know what i'm saying though it doesn't just yeah. evaporate. it all has to go somewhere whether it's recycled or whatever it's done somebody touches this and moves it so it all which always involves money so we got to sell through that and then we got to start supporting ourselves in bmx god man i hope that this doesn't lead to more framed and more elites and companies like that yeah see i think some of those companies too when you get to the root of them and i really hope it doesn't either because honestly one thing i'm tired of doing is i'm tired of fighting the bottom feeders i'm trying i'm tired of fighting the elites the frames the framed hey elite does pay some people so that is a that is a positive. I didn't I'll, know that. That's good. I'll give them credit for that, you know. But again, I don't love the fact of what they're doing is literally trying to create the cheapest bike possible. It's just not. It's. It's not a long-term business plan. Well, and it's, I don't mean to interrupt <laughs> you, but to not even just taking into account how bad that is for BMX. We could talk about the freaking safety aspect of that. It's a huge safety aspect. That's just going to get people hurt. Well, and I'm really curious who's like, I'm, so there's numerous ways those bikes happen, right? They're either bikes that people are buying up gray market parts to get that cheaper price. Or what they are is there is factories and they can be good. They can be good factories, but what they'll do is on their website, they'll show 15 models of bikes. Mm -hmm. So lots of times what those framed framed bikes can be is they're actually just what I would consider a stock OEM bike. They just bought it off their website. Yeah. Cool, what's the price of this? I'll buy that. I want it painted in this color with this sticker. You know, and not every, there's not, they're not always horrible bikes either. Like yeah. I have a cargo e-bike in behind my wife's car that it's that type of bike and it's a it's a dialed bike like for a cargo e-bike it's you know and it just happens to be a factory that makes a shitload of e-bikes and they got a bunch of parts dumped on them so they put a bunch of parts together and you know emailed a bunch of people their pricing you know and you can have this bike at this price and it's enticing for someone you know imagine you're a businessman you used to ride bmx 
you start Googling, there's a bike boom. This is what happened. People started Googling, oh, there's a bike boom? I used to be into bikes. They start Googling stuff. Well, it's easier now than ever to search the internet and find a factory to build your stuff. You're not gonna find a good factory overnight, but you can find a factory fairly easy online. So they find those factories, and then all of a sudden they see a BMX bike, that, that's actually pretty dialed, let me email them. Then they find out there's more bikes they could make like that. And that's, that's how lots of that stuff occurs. That's pretty interesting. It's, yeah, I mean, that, I mean that helps humanize it. it. Yeah, I mean, we think BMX is bad. You should look at e-bikes as like the absolute worst and scariest market for that right now. Oh, dude. Because there's so many like third party this, this, that, and that. And it's like, it's, you know, you look at them and you're like, that battery weighs 10 pounds, but the down tube's like the size of my shoestring. That's gonna break. <laughs> or it's like this just very clearly bike that was not made to be an e-bike that they slap the battery onto or yep. situations like that. I've seen those online and I've had emails from those companies. Oh, like, I bet. Will They're you hot. promote our $1,500 e-bike? And me being me, I'm like, I'll promote it, but I'm going to like do a, I'm going to tell people that, it's, yeah. you know, I'm going to tell people what it is and I'm going to yep. be honest about it, but I'm going to get a bike out of it because exactly. Why would I not take advantage of this? Like you should, this company that's trying to take advantage of other mm -hmm. people. Yep. Just be totally real about it. Like, so and I think, <laughs> I think people having these conversations and voicing their opinion about it helps. Mm -hmm. But I think what's happened a lot too is that BMX in general has somewhat been bad about educating and being welcoming to the general mom and pop bike shop. Yeah. Um, you know, Haro sold at a lot of mom and pop bike shops. We probably have the exact opposite problem as a company like Fit, where they probably sell to more core BMX shops and less mom and pop shops, where we're the other way around, where I want to sell to more core bike shops as well. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you go into these mom and pipe pop bike shops and you start talking to them and it's like they just got turned off by BMX because they weren't being supported by BMX at all. You know, and it's nobody's fault, but it's everybody's fault at the same time. So I think some of it is how do we work as riders or as BMXers? How do we work with the local shops, right? Well, sometimes it's as easy as if you're throwing a jam at a skate park, just see what shops are around and walk in and say, hey, would you mind if I threw this flyer and I'll put your name on it? You should stop by and check it out. Then that shop stops by and check it out and they see... 50 kids there and he's like shit I can order 10 ODI long necks and I can sell those in the next month and then all of a sudden he's ordering a uh, Colt sprocket then next thing you know he's ordering a, a pair of fiend cranks and handlebars you know it's it's just a we got to start small and start building it back up mm -hmm. especially at the mom and pop shop level because as much as I'm all for people selling online you got to protect the shops at the same time you know we all sell online and I don't have a problem with it um, I don't believe Haro sells every bike online, but what I do believe in is that there should be necessary different prices. I've seen some people do stuff where it says pick up locally, buy now right to my house. And then you click them and there might be a 20 different dollar price difference. Yeah. You, know, you got to you. That's a good scenario, right? Because the company is still telling you to go buy it at a shop. And one of the companies I clicked on because I was curious about this, they actually stated why. We want you to purchase this at a shop, but we understand you might not have a local shop within X miles. And they stated it is important that this is assembled right. Yeah. You know, and that does matter because it goes back to having that good experience on a bike. Yep. And doesn't Haro have some program like that on their mm -hmm. site where they like – I, for, I forget. It's been so long since I looked Yeah, at it. a lot of people do. Ours is, they've got some, I would say a bit, maybe a corny term for it, but it's click, ship, and ride. So it's basically like you ship it to the shop and you pick it up and it's rideable. You don't okay. have to build it. And I think that's great. And I argue with our sales manager like, hey, BMX is kind of the wild, wild west right now. Everybody's selling online. And he'll, he'll come back and be like, you're nuts. Like literally... I'm sure in his head he thinks I'm completely batshit nuts, which is fine. But to me, what I'm really saying is 
we should sell online, but we should support the shops. Mm -hmm. I'm fine with somebody paying more online. I don't, I want the shop to make money as well, you know? And um, so our click ship and ride bikes, Haro makes less on one of those being sold and going to a shop and being built than if we just sold the bike to the shop. Yeah. I believe what we do, and I would have to ask one of the shops that participates in it or our sales manager, I believe what we do is actually give the shop a form of credit for building it. Nice. Where they might get 20 or $40 for building the bike, which is fair. You know, it's labor. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. And I think through things like that and then shop stops coming back from yep. different companies and taking their riders around and we, everybody goes on trips. So my, my, why not look up like what shop is local to that area and check it out. Exactly. And that's always a cool thing, right? Like, um, I was shooting a kink trip in Kansas and you know, I was just asking J Row cause I was curious, you know, what the scenario was where we go into a shop because going to a shop, and I wish shops understood this. It's really, aggr- it's a bit nerve wracking for the riders, right? Mm-hmm. It can even be nerve wracking for somebody like me. And I love spending time in bike shops because all of a sudden you're getting out of the van. They don't know this, but you spent the last night out because you got an amazing, you know, everyone got clips the day before. So you had a great night out. Yeah. And now all of a sudden you're at a shop and you know, it's just, you're kind of pigeonholed and you're trapped, you know, you're like a cat in a cage. But so what Kink was doing, and I'm sure they still do, and what um, Haro has done, and other and numerous brands have done this. J-Row was one of the more first people I saw doing it, was he would do shop stops when they were on trips, like this one in Kansas. We were in Kansas for five days or whatever it was. Hey, well, we're going to the local skate park. There's only two decent BMX shops there or whatever at the time. So let's hit both of them up and tell them they should both set up easy ups and sell stuff if they want or just support it so that way the local scene then sees that and it's more comfortable for the riders because now they're in their regular environment so that's that's a better experience for the consumer as well because then they're they're not just they're not going up to chad or dennis and be like can you sign this you're behind a table sitting at a table when's Mm -hmm. the last time dennis sat at a table with a pen (laughs) like come on it's not it's not, you're better off just having them at a skate park and inviting it, you know? you Same thing as BMX. If we build BMX, we all do better. If we build if we build the scene, the, everybody does better, including the bike shops. Yeah, that makes sense. I think uh, we'll see a lot more of that because I think people are really, like, realizing it right yeah. now, too, as, like, everybody's able to pretty freely just go wherever and do wherever again. We can do those things and i think that kind of they started to get lost before even covid happened a little bit and yeah did hopefully they fully come back yeah i really hope they do and you know the other thing i hope that happens too is that it's like say colt's having a jam i don't expect robbie to call me and be like bring the haro easy up Mm -hmm. but other brands shouldn't feel bad about supporting right you know whereas um if uh, say Robbie had a jam and it was in San Diego, well, Dennis and Chad live in San Diego, so it's still a jam. It still would be awesome to have those dudes come and support the jam. Yeah, you know, and it's the same thing. Like, dude, I hate saying this, but I'm a little bit bummed at the San Diego scene because you know Gary Young runs the YMCA and. That YMCA down there, Mission Valley, has always really supported BMX. Mm-hmm. So Gary threw the Turkey Day Jam, and it's like, where is everybody? Not uh, that there wasn't people riding it and having fun, but it's like, you know how many pros live in San Diego? Yeah, a lot, I'm sure. There was more pros there from outside of San Diego. Man, than I always San- find that so weird. I do too, and I'm not these dudes are my friends so i'm not talking saying anything i wouldn't say to their face but at the same time it's like dude your sponsor shouldn't have to call nobody should have to call anybody and say do you mind going it's just like yo this event's going on let's get together and go support it we'll go hit a street spot before and after we'll stop by for an hour or we'll go 
you know, because I know it's, I don't want to always sit at a contest all day in a booth mm-hmm. or an eat up, whatever it is, but it's important. That's what you do. Like that's how, at the end of the day, that's why, that's, that's how we're all able to go to the skate park or not have real jobs. Like none of us have real jobs. We're like, Dude, like literally. I make bikes for a living. It's, like, <laughs> yeah. it's stupid. I, yeah, I, I always find that so strange because I've always felt like if there's an event going on locally here, I don't care what the event is. If it's BMX and there's people having it, I want to be there. I want to be there if I can. I want to yeah. film it if I can because I want people to be able to watch it later. Yeah. And, and like, I'm going to be there the entire day. I know some people might not feel that way, but like I've always found it so strange when local people just don't go to these events. Yeah. And you know, like we've all been guilty and dude, I totally get it. Like I completely get why somebody wouldn't want to be there all day. Yeah. Right. I get that too. When it's 15, 20 minutes from your house, even if you're taking your girlfriend out on a date that day, just stop by. Just be like, babe, I'm sorry. Like, I'm going to pay for this dinner later that I got from the check from, from the bicycle. So I need to stop by for a half an hour, an hour, and I need to shake hands and kiss some babies. Like it just, those kids, dude, it means so much. And like, I was really reminded of that. Like whenever you go to other countries where things are smaller, less, uh, less at your fingertips. But like when we did the Haro Cuba trip, dude, this girl, cried and got on her knees when she saw Paris. Like <laughs> literally amazing. she made Paris tear up. And it was like <clears throat> it just reminded me, I'm like, what the you know, what is like they're that happy. There's a hundred of you kids here. Yeah. And you all ride and you all kill it and you're that happy to meet you know mm-hmm. and to all us it's like Paris is amazing, but Paris is just it's a friend. It's a you know, it's another BMXer. But there's people out there that like meeting that one person means the world. And I've seen it with Garrett before. Like I've been in airports before where some BMX rides, but Garrett. And it's like, to me, I'm just like, you know, but to that kid, it really, it makes them realize they're real and that that's obtainable. Yeah, man. That can happen. If you, if you really want to throw your body at the ground for that many years, you can do that with your life. It, yeah. And this might be a hot take here, but I don't think it is. If you're in that position and you're you're up to that point where people are looking at you that way, you should want to be there for the people who help keep you there. Yeah. Like you deserve you, a private life. 100%. You deserve yeah. a private life because I've also been in situations where like friends of their names have got called out and you're like, "Man, you don't know this, but they got the flu right now and they're just trying to get home." Or what, you know, so you're like, you know, it's all substantial, but yeah, I mean, you have a point, and I think, I mean, BMX doesn't do enough for the pro, so let me just say that. I mean, in general, well, I think true. The, the pros, the value of the pro has been diluted a little bit. The mm. lines have been blurred. Yeah, well, you know, that's it true. It used to be like, there's flow, then there's am, where you might be getting paid for some product, but you're as good as a pro, but you haven't really put a couple video parts out or proven yourself, or... You know, you're am you're going on trips, and then there's pro where you're making enough that you can afford rent and a car payment. You know, you can have a cell phone. You know, yeah. But, but now it's like I feel like the lines are just they're too blurred. You know, and I you know I love that you brought up and people talk about the ambassador style stuff all the time, and I think that's awesome. Like, I think that's good, but it's important for us to remember an ambassador is not a pro, right? Yeah. Well, so. And that's that's where we have to make the lines not as blurred. But I also will admit there's guys on premium. Um, there's guys on probably guys on Haro where some of their contract stipulates them doing a certain amount of social post or whatever. Mm-hmm. And it's not it's not like a hard line like, oh, dude, we were supposed to post four times this month and uni post three. It's it's just there so that way people know like this is an expectation yeah you know this small amount of your check does come from you doing this you know and i think that bmx is guilty in the past of not calling that out you know not saying that like dude this is legitimately part of your job like 
you, you know, it's your job. <laughs> um, but I do think I think COVID in general for humanity, it slowed everybody down. Right. It made us realize what was really more important mm -hmm. in life. Like for me, it made me realize uh, how, you know, how important family is, you know, uh, my significant other and other things like that. It made me realize how important how much I missed that or needed that because I was so busy just how, how many stairs can I lay on to shoot a photo today or, you know, this or that. So it slowed everything down. I made it, it, it slowed everything down for everybody have time to think as much as everybody in BMX was rushing to try to get bikes. It also now, I think it's made the professional BMXers and all of us evaluate this, like what, and it made the riders more appreciative. You know, because finally companies were telling riders real information. Mm. Like, I I lived with Nathan for years, and I Nathan's the homie. But it would amaze me. I would say something like, "Is that really what it is?" Or you know, and it'd be like the little thing. Like, yeah, you didn't know that. Yeah. And it just amazes me because at Fiend, I always really really appreciate Garrett for this. Everything was really transparent. That's awesome. Like if your sales weren't going good, nobody was yelling at you, but it'd be like, yo, dude, we got to do something like we all got to work together. Let's push this or let's let's try to work on this. So I always thought that was really good. But it amazes me how lots of companies aren't that as transparent with their riders or maybe more brings up the situation of people quitting online, like stuff like that. Like the riders, the communication needs to be better, I guess, is what I'm saying. Yeah. And I think with COVID, how it made me and everybody slow down and really think about stuff because we all didn't have shit to do there for a minute. I think it made the riders and all of us as BMXers appreciate it more. Yeah. So I'm hoping now that we all appreciate what we had three years ago and we all work to bring that back. Because it's, yeah. and I know everybody wants it to be there, but we all have to actually do it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, uh, when it comes to that whole ambassador thing, I will talk about that every chance I get because you should. I feel like it is the solution to so many problems because like how you made the distinction between like ambassador and pro, I don't necessarily think we'd call anything ambassador or whatever. I just think that every single writer for a company should have that code that they give out. It yep. might give a five percent discount, whatever it is, just something, or something, something. Yeah. And then when somebody uses that code to buy something, it gets credited. The purchase gets credited to that rider, and yep. maybe they make something from that. If it's an AM guy, he gets a set amount. That money goes into the trip fund, whatever it might be. If whatever you're, it is, yeah. <clears throat> if you're pro, you make a you make your salary, you make whatever you make a month, and then if you sell, like can you imagine? If but pro, they, you know most most pros. And I would, every single pro I know gets paid with, if there's a, a name on their pro, product, they're getting paid. Some yeah. of them, not enough. Some of them very healthy, mm -hmm. you know, Bean is really good at taking care of their riders royalty wise. Yeah. It's something Garrett props himself in. And I think that's, a, it's awesome that he does what he does and he does as much as he can for the signature product. But they're still getting paid for that. The pros are just getting paid in a different way, right? Like, yeah. if Dennis posts his bike right now and he gets a sale, he's still getting a percentage of that bike. You know, it's built in, you know. Yeah, I'm just saying so, it's like an incentive for for riders actual, to yeah. really, like, really want to do what their job is. Like, they really, you know, if they make an Instagram post or they, they feel like they need to push something, Whereas right now, I feel like there might be people who just like blow off even tagging their sponsors in a post. Oh, yeah. Mm hmm. No, there definitely is. And some people just completely forget it. But yeah, well, that, you know, yeah. Um, no, I mean, it's 100 percent definitely true. People take things as for granted, right? Like they're expected. Yeah. In a way, um, you know, but yeah, I think there's totally room for ambassador stuff. And like at Haro, we do that a lot. We own a road bike company called Mozzie. Okay. Um, Mozzie doesn't have right now a race team or any sponsored sponsored riders, but we've got some really kick ass ambassadors. Mm. You know, like and and those guys really do do a lot. And 
you know, they're on programs like that. Some of them just get free frames and just tag us when you get a chance, you know, because just to get it out there. Some of them probably do get a kickback off of a coupon code or whatnot. But I think the ambassador thing is something that should come more into play. And it is to me, it's a form of commission, right? Most yeah, sales exactly. people get commission. Yep. So how does it hurt to give that same percentage to your riders? It doesn't even have to be a discount code. It yeah. can just be, here's the link. You, If you use this link, you can get whatever the, I don't know what commission rates are in sales. I haven't been in sales in years, but you know, whatever that rate is, you should share it with your athletes or even, you know, one thing during COVID that like our, at Haro, one of the guys always said, he's like, you're all salespeople now. Sorry, that's the situation. You mm -hmm. all get sales. So at brands too, I think everyone should also think that way. You know, I've, I mean, I'm really bad with my Instagram. I don't really check it as often or barely post, but I don't own all those bikes behind me. Mm -hmm. Like there's a very expensive e-mountain bike that I ride once a, a few times a week that I love. I make a point at least a couple times a month to just on my story, thank Haro for the fun. Yeah. Because th without that, that three hours of riding that day, I wouldn't have had fun, right? Mm -hmm. Or if I go ride BMX or something, I'll try to, I try to have, and it's hard to have a conscious effort, but I try to start having a conscious effort of like, Haro posted this, I made that product and I am proud of it, so I should be loud about it and I should say that. Yeah. So I think we all, you know, if we all let our guard down and do, we all be ambassadors for yeah. BMX as well. Yeah, man. Yeah. And so, you know, comment on that. Even if you don't work for Colt, comment on that sick DAC video. Yep. You know, reach message people and reach out to them and let them know that you appreciate what they're doing. Yeah. And I think with this whole like ambassador idea and codes and links and all this stuff, I think at first when you see pros starting to do it, it's going to see pushback because it doesn't look cool to do that i feel like it makes you look like you're trying to be an influencer or whatever but as soon as yeah, that I think hump... people are i think people are, are uh real like over that now i hope you so. know like i there definitely was that point when people are like that and i think some people might be like that but there's also a smart way of doing it right like yep. uh what nathan what did i forget what nathan just gave away he just gave away something right okay and all pros give away shit like if you're in san diego you probably are riding an old pros frame anyway <laughs> yeah so nathan just gave something away well kink didn't support that they can't support him giving away something used yeah but what he just did was something an ambassador would do he just helped out somebody else and he didn't do it for followers in fact i nathan probably couldn't even tell you how many followers he has that's how much he could probably care less about Instagram in the grand scheme of things. But what he did was, I remember it because you had to leave a comment on what you're thankful for, right? Mm -hmm. So what he did was he created a bunch of positivity. Yep. And kink and his frame were the center of it. So it was great for kink, I'm sure, too, you know? So even simple things like that. Yeah, man. I did uh, a bike giveaway a couple of years ago where there you go. The, the way you entered this giveaway was to put the city and state that you live in or something like that and then the local bike shop of your area you had to name the local bike shop and if you didn't have one like whatever the closest or mail order you ordered from was yeah. that's and that's a good idea too you know it's and then that's going to help the local bike shop out yep just promoting those kinds of things and i think we, we're just. I wish I was paying attention to your stuff then. I would have told our sales reps they have to watch it to look for bike shop names. <laughs> well, it's still out there. Like the video is still online, so you could still find it on my channel. And there's like a couple hundred shops that were there's something crazy that was listed on there. But just stuff like that. And I think if we get people just thinking that way, and it's all literally just to help the riders help the companies yep. because if the riders realize oh my goodness i can make more money by trying to help my company sell stuff you're helping the rider mm -hmm. and the company at the same time it just makes sense yeah and the riders need it like flat out like they they need it there shouldn't it's just always so skewed to me how it's like you know and you got it's like i said the lines get blur because you'll have one 
pro rider that's making an eighth of what another pro rider is making. And you're like, man. And I'm just talking about uh, epidemic sponsors, sponsors from the bicycle industry. Not, you know, it's different when you start adding in, you know, Snickers bars or whoever, right. you know, whatever, you know, deodorant company. That's a whole different world. But, you know, it's just it's interesting how blurred those lines are. Like, what is the bottom, you know, where is, you know, and I think that's been more in the recent past 10 years than ever, you know, and it and I get it. Like if I was a kid and someone's like, dude, I'll give you 250 and I'm turning you pro. I'd be like, let's do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like and then you're and then all of a sudden you're 23 and you're like, yeah, that two hundred and fifty dollars that. That's less than the gas or that's that's my how much it costs for me to eat, you know, ramen for a month, you know. Yep. So I think we do need to also that's another thing we need to uplift and support the pro riders then the riders in general at the end of the day like you know i mean i spent a lot of time with garrett so i don't mind quoting him but at one time i think i it might have been over a beer or something but i think he was like laughing and just said like i literally throw my body at the ground for a living like i you know and it's like yeah you should make more money lebron james doesn't throw his body at the ground he throws a ball through the air yep and most of those guys Okay, maybe but, not most. I'm not gonna piss. I don't know off. what they make. I'm assuming it's like tens of forties of millions. And if they fall and hit the ground, they're like done. <laughs> yeah, they for, don't start. Yeah, whereas somebody like Garrett, they fall and hit the ground for four hours straight to get that five second clip. Yep. You know, so it's like you gotta. There is a way for us to promote it better and us do better as a whole. And I think some of the stuff that we all hate. You know, like not hate, but some of the stuff is core BMXers were like, you know, I don't hate the dirt jump scene or slope style scene at all. In fact, I'm actually the one that designs the new dirt jumps and slope styles at Haro. Hey. And me personally, I'd rather ride a BMX at a skate park. But if it's a super bumpy, um, you know, a pump track is actually better on a 26 inch. Mm -hmm. But what we could do as BMXers is get more involved at pump tracks. We could do that. Right. That's. Uh, you know, uh, but like a, back to the dirt jump stuff, I'll ride a dirt jumper at a beat up set of trails or whatever, like Sweetwater Park down here. Yeah, it's in a cool little pump track with a cool few jumps. But through the one lift is like, oh, well, you that don't sucks. Put that on a dirt jumper. So if I would ride a dirt jumper there, but, you know, maybe we, instead of just hating on that, we should look at it and be like, why do those contests do good? OK, well. They've got way too much money. We don't have the money, but this contest is a bunch of jumps in the middle of the city. Yeah. Well, we could easily find a part of the city to build a couple things. We did. Uh, Fudger did it for Go Bike Day. He yeah. built a hand down a few things. Could do something cool at a grassroots level. You know, that's the thing. Maybe we need to think about why to a consumer that's more eye appealing to sit and watch and in golf you know mm -hmm. and one thing you know if you i hate like i don't i don't want to be that guy that brings up mountain biking or anything but i do spend i do mountain bike as much as i bmx you know and so i do look at like well, what are they doing you know because it's the bike industry there's that whole argument is don't look at the skate industry well you should to a degree you know you look outside your industry or within your industry in the mountain bike case well one thing that mountain bikes did that was good is all the companies get together and they all work for trail advocacy oh yeah <laughs> Where, where's the skate park advocacy for bmx we're all too busy like fighting over that like five dollars that's left in the bottom of the pie at the end of the day that's stale anyway yeah man you man. know maybe maybe we should all join forces and try to help build more skate parks or not you know you don't even have to help build more skate parks whatever it is you know some schools at gym classes teach kids to have ride but to ride bikes yep i there's a bunch of preschools in san diego that get free push bikes that are haro push bikes maybe we all need to work together to come up with a foundation that donates uh bmx bikes to middle schools so that way we can reinstate programs like that because i don't think they do it in california i'm from the east coast they definitely did it when i was in school but maybe we can reinstate different things like that to get kids back on bmx bikes yeah so two things there uh one is i feel like through listening to a lot of stuff we're saying <clears throat> there will probably be people who are like yeah but it's so easy to just say all this stuff 
and that's kind of the no, entire is. point of what we're doing is that we're saying this so that maybe someone might hear it and act on it. Just just putting that put out there. Out, put it out in the world, right? <laughs> yeah. So then the other thing is that I actually talked yesterday with uh, Shane Fernandez. He's the president yeah. of USA BMX. They have yep. the USA BMX Foundation, which actually does that. They they give they try to get people on bikes, so they work with schools and and things like that. So that's Shane hit me up. I had too many bikes in my warehouse. <clears throat> well, there you go. <laughs> but no, you know, we're talking about reducing some um, uh, inventory, right? That's mm -hmm. one right there. If every company gave five bikes away, we can all afford five bikes. We all yeah. have five bikes that have scratches on them from shipping or whatever. If we all gave five bikes, there's at least 10 BMX companies. That's 50 more people riding bikes than there was the day before, you know? So some of it really just, no one's going to grow BMX for us. Nope. We're BMXers. We're, we're a bit rowdy. We're a bit, you know, whatever, unruly, some of us. So it is what it is. We have, if we want this to last and grow, if we really want it to be bigger, then we all have to work together and we all have to do our part. Yep. But, and, uh, and another thing you said, nobody's going to do it for us. No. BMX isn't going to let other people do it for us because when outside people come exactly. in, they get hated on and pushed out, which I get to an extent, yeah. but I also always say like, you got to take advantage of those people and take everything that you can before they want to go away because yep. they're going to leave eventually anyways, but absolutely right, man. Yeah. It's, you know, it, it just, it, that's, that's my whole thing right now is just how I've been trying to think of a bunch of ways of what to do or what, you know, and it is tough, you know, people saying it's just talk. It's like, it is just talk, but we have to put it out there. It's the same as a contest I want to do at Haro and invite other companies. Mm -hmm. Haro's down for it, but how do you get the money? You you know? Yeah. While still keeping it BMX. You know, and that that's the that's the tough part. I just know I don't want to see it grow to a point that it's taking advantage of. I feel like some stuff in the cycling industry has been taken advantage of or diluted, you know, but I think there is a way to grow it where it doesn't get taken advantage of or diluted. Yeah. And if it's the riders who are the ones helping do that, guess what you do it. They're going to have BMX best interest at heart when they're doing yep. it. And like you said, we need to remember like, and we need to think about like as much as we all want to be the cool guy or any involved in the super cool stuff, there's stuff that is out there that people are doing. That's real positive. That might not be super cool to you, mm -hmm. but it's super cool to that kid. You know, like you mentioned Shane. Well, we're both friends with Tony D, right? Yeah. So the other day he reached out to me and, you know, USA BMX and Shane and Tony. Sorry, Kyle, if I word things wrong. They have a magazine called Pull. Yeah. Most of it, it kind of reminds me of uh, the old ABA, ABA magazines where most of it's very race based. You know, Tony reached out, I was like, we want to do more BMX, blah, 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 this and that. I'm like, you know, and of course, my BMXer and me texted him right back and was like, do you ever read Dig? You need something with content. I just don't want to see photos of racing. Well, I realized within two minutes of that text message, I was being an asshole. <laughs> because here he is doing something positive, trying to grow BMX. And all I'm thinking about is how the magazine might not be printed on the best paper. Yeah. Well, <laughs> It's another magazine, so as a photographer, first off, I should be damn thankful, and as a BMXer, I should be thankful that they're doing it. Yep. Shane doesn't need to do any of it. None of it's good for any of our health. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, nobody's getting rich off BMX. Yeah. At all. There's I... a few people that might have been able to buy a house. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they fed their kids. <clears throat> you know, there's a few people that'll retire, but. At the end of the day, it's, you know, it's not a get rich thing. We're not Tesla, you know, let's, we got to put our guard down and help out each other. Yeah. I think BMX has a tendency or you can't say BMX, but a lot of people in BMX have a tendency to just, the something new comes around, they, they jump on the hate side of it. And then a yeah. couple years goes by and they realize, <clears throat> oh, wait a minute, this isn't that bad. And I'm actually for whatever this thing is is well, <clears throat> sorry no you're good well and that's just it right like 
I deal with it at work because I don't just do BMX product anymore. I also do lifestyle bikes like city commuter bikes and the dirt jump stuff and stuff like that. And that stuff's fun, man. Like sometimes I'll be doing that stuff and I'll come up with a BMX idea because I'm looking at some weird tech in another realm. But what I'm getting at is that like you'd be amazed. Like I know he's going to text me and tell if he's watching this and tell me to go F off. But like I text a friend the other day, he sent an Instagram thing of what he did on a Peloton bike. And I was like, buy a fucking road bike and go outside. I'll give you a road bike, go outside and ride it <laughs> F off. And it's like, I know the comment F off. It's not really F off, but it's like, no, I'll, I don't need to ride a road bike. I'm a BMXer. And it's like, stop being closed minded, like open up your mind. Maybe you'll have fun. That's all I'm saying. Or, and I, I translate it not really to the road bike thing, but really to the, the big wheel BMX thing. Right. It's like people talk shit and they're mad and stuff like that, or not mad, but they see that some companies are putting effort into that. Well, do you not think that the money, say a company like Haro, do you not think the money that is sold on either an old school style bike or a Haro slow ride BMX bike. Do not think that's not going back into the riders pockets. Yeah, like no. if it wasn't, if it wasn't for big wheel BMX, I bet you there'd be some more pros seeing pay cuts or not being able to do what they used to do or whatnot, you know? So we all need to realize that even though it's not for all of us, right? You might not, I don't love doing wheelies. I have one. I use it as a beach cruiser. It's way better. It's funner than riding a beach cruiser to me because I still bunny hop it. Mm -hmm. You know, Chad's got a signature one. And if you ask me, I think it's a dope bike for Chad. When we sat down and talked about it and I pitched it to him, you know, he's, his exact statement is cool. I want to make it loud, man. Like, I want this bike to be loud. And I'm like, that's awesome. It gives this, you doing a big wheel bike that, you're just going to do some wheelies while you're out riding with your girlfriend. You know, you're not, you might not totally engulf yourself in that world, but you're going to enjoy the bike. It allows you to show another side of you. That's more loud. Yeah. Chad yeah. couldn't build a BMX bike. That's black and gold metal plate yeah. that wouldn't sell. Like I would be telling him, no, like that's not going to, you know, or, you know, so I think you got to understand too, with some people have to understand those things. It all comes back to BMX, right? There's a, I was about to come out with, I don't know, I call them moped style e-bikes. Not really a moped, not really a Super 73. It's that style bike, but it's done a hard way. Well, it's not a BMX bike. I'm never going to say it's a BMX bike, but that skew, that, that part number is under BMX. Mm -hmm. So where does the profit look like it goes? Into BMX. Uh -huh. What does that help do? fun pro riders, fun jams, fun, fun, all this stuff, you know, like I did the, uh, I did a 27.5 wheelie bike called the Johnny five. I think I've talked to you about it before. Yeah. And that bike was when I started was somewhat controversial. John Bolgens will tell you, you had him on, he'll tell you he didn't want to make it. <clears throat> he kept getting suggested. You should make this. You should make this. Then he asked me, have you ever worked on e-bikes? And I'm like, well, at a factory once I helped figure out what's, to, I helped design a down tube. So I've done some stuff. So, you know, people will tell you different sales reps or whoever else, you know, will say, hey, like we should at least look at this. There's companies doing this. And my answer is that's not a BMX bike at all. That Johnny Five is not a BMX bike. It is an E bike for a, an E lifestyle bike that resembles our BMX heritage. That's it. Mm -hmm. But again, the same thing. That's a BMX part number. So Those aren't cheap BMX. bikes. Those they're like two thousand or eighteen hundred dollar bikes. I think. I don't know what the retail is, but they're expensive. That all comes back to BMX. You know. So we have to remember, as we're talking shit, that some of the stuff we sometimes talk shit on supports us as well. Yeah. Would you rather companies? totally outside of bmx be able like be taking like, well, advantage of this or would you rather and that's exactly it i i it was fudger just talked about an rbmx podcast and i need to reach out for fudger because he's local and just let him ride one of the stupid things because they're actually they're actually 
really fun. Yeah. Like if I have to go to 7-Eleven for a six pack at night down the street, I'm going 30 just holding a throttle down the street. That's it's, dope. It's, it's not bad. It, it's, not, it's not a BMX bike though. But so what Fudger brought up was I think the company is called Swift. Okay. But don't Instagram it because you'll get constant ads for it. So look it up on Google. But it literally is a 20 inch BMX e-bike. That to me is crossing the line. There's no, that is, there is no reason for that. They're mm. selling it as a BMX bike. That's not, you could never ride a skate park on one of these things. You'd die. They're so heavy. Yeah. You know, like on the one we make, bunny hopping up a curb is fine. But if you try, if I probably couldn't bunny hop up a three stair on it, yeah. I'd probably case a three stair. It's heavy. But if I'm going to go for when my child's born and I'm going to go for a ride with the wife, I'm probably going to take that because it's more comfortable and I don't have to pedal up hills, you know? So I think we have to realize that even as companies start looking just outside the realm, as long as they respect the BMX roots and what BMX is at the core, I think it's okay to do certain other bikes. It makes perfect sense, man. And I've because never even considered that. Because if not, that company that. Swift is going to come in and take the money fucking anyway. Exactly. And that's the point I was just going to make again is like, I had never thought about it that way until you just said that. And that like, if Haro doesn't make that bike, if another company doesn't make that bike, then a random company that has nothing to do with BMX and doesn't have any BMX riders involved is going to make the bike and make the money when someone was going to buy it anyway. The person who's buying that bike wasn't going to consider a BMX bike. They no, were going to buy totally it. Totally other... different person. Totally yeah. different person. So why not have that money go into BMX from that random person? Yeah. And I don't I just looked before I made this statement to make sure nobody did something I told them not to, but if you click on big wheel bike, not big wheel BMX, mm -hmm. it shows up. But if you click on e-bike, e-lifestyle, anything like that on Haro, it shows up again. Yeah. So by no means in even the advertising and video work that Joey did, it was never called a BMX bike, <laughs> you know, for a reason. It's not. It's just a it's a fun bike with BMX handlebars and stem and fork. You know, it, it lo resembles a BMX bike. Yeah, I think I think that's such a good point to bring up and just consider things. I, I, you know what it is? It's just that people like to hate on stuff. They like to talk shit. They just, exactly. That's just what and it is. And it's fun, man. Like, I'm a big shit talker. Yeah. Like, I, don't, I love it. Like, trust me, I talk a lot of shit. I've got a big fucking mouth when it comes down to it. <laughs> but at the end of the day, I'll admit when I'm wrong. You know, mm -hmm. and, and that bike and even the moped style bike, that, that moped style bike won't show up on big wheel BMX or nothing. It'll only show up on just our e-bike page. But even with that, I kind of, uh, you know, and then I sat back, you know, got out of my head a little bit. And I'm like, shit. If it, that would probably be fun to ride, though, you know, and mm -hmm. I'm like, if it's fun to ride, it's another person riding bikes. It's another person spouting the Haro name on it, you know, yeah. plus the guy that did the artwork for that. It's an old BMX pro racer in the UK. So it's like somebody's making a healthy check doing the artwork for it, too. You know, so it's like you find these ways and that's, you know, I, people. And I got to go soon because I can smell dinner, but yeah, um, no worries. People always talk about sustainability, right? Yep. If you're a BMX company or a bike company, hire people that ride bikes or ride BMX. I don't care. And, and we're all guilty of this. If you're hiring for a warehouse job, chances are a BMX is going to be too lazy to really do it. But at least <laughs> try to put it out to your homies, you know, be yeah. like, look, man, it's only twelve dollars an hour. It's dirty. It's cold. But you're a bike rider. Maybe you want to do it, you know, mm. or and I think we can I think we need to look at sustainability, not just as a cardboard straw. Right. It's sustainability as in sustainability in our industry, supporting things like Gary's Turkey Jam, supporting a shop stop that another bike company put on. Yeah. Um, you know, if you got to buy a photo, go to a BMX or to buy a BMX photo, go to a mountain biker to buy a mountain bike photo, you yep. know, or go to, a, go to BMX, shoot the mountain bike photo, even better. Joey Cobb shoots all our mountain bike photos. That's not going to the mountain bike industry. It's going to Joey. Yep. You know, so it's like you got to sustain in your own industry. And I think that's really 
we, we got to look at, like I said, we all got to work together. We got to grow BMX and we got to think about how to sustain BMX. You know, there's not, you're not going to find a CFO to be your BMX, a BMX rider to be a CFO, right? You might. All you're going to do hard. is the whole company is going to be on a fucking road trip for two years yeah. and nothing's, nothing's going to happen. But at the end of the day, you could definitely hire salespeople that ride BMX or that ride bikes. You know, and we all have to remember different people get different enjoyment out of bikes, right? Like there's people, there's somebody in our office. Um, she's a, good, a great sales rep. She just rides big wheel BMX bikes all over the beach nonstop. But she loves it. It's yeah. good for her. You know, it's like as long as you're riding a bike, I'm with it. Yeah, I think the uh, concept of supporting your own and supporting everything goes even deeper than just like the industry and professional side too in that like, if you see another crew in your state or locally to you throw in a jam, hi. go to the jam. Yep. Go to the jam. Just because there's people who organizing it who you don't ride with all the time, go to the fucking mm -hmm. jam. Don't just be post yourself on Instagram riding somewhere else unless you have like a reason for that. I see that so much. I'm like, what is well, wrong with you? Well, you got to realize a lot of time there's a backlog of stuff, right? Like I've seen, like there's been posts, there's, somebody posted a photo and tagged me that cause I shot it this week. Yeah. The photo is two years old. Well, I'm talking about like Instagram stories, like that's oh, we're same, at this place right now. Like, I mean, that's the same thing though, man. Cause some of those, like some pros are real smart, you know, where it's like, they might have five or six little Instagram stories sitting, just sitting there. Cause that day they're actually out with their chick. But yeah, they, they should post. I'm talking about local people who are oh, pros. Okay. I'm talking about people who like post after a jam happens that they're set. They had a good session at this park today, okay. and and I get that. Yeah, maybe you had something else going on. And you could only ride this place, but I've seen it so many times where yeah. people have no legitimate excuse not to go to an event and just don't go to it. Yeah, and it's like hey, you just know, go. It's it's a and. It's the self-isolating thing, right? Like we got to find ways to welcome people in. Yeah. You know, we're not, it's not pot. BMX is not posh trails. Like that should be isolated from the general public. You right. should have a friend of a friend to go there. Yeah. But the local skate park isn't that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's, there's street spots that you absolutely should not give up, of course, because if not, they're not going to be there. But you know, if somebody wants to know where the, the yellow bank Jersey barriers in downtown San Diego, everybody should tell them. I mean, everybody knows anyway, but you know what I'm saying? It's like, we got to welcome people into this as well. Yeah. Don't gatekeep so hard. Yeah. And, and the gatekeep thing's real. I mean, oh, it definitely sure. is. And it's a, it's a good and a bad thing, but there's definitely, there has to be a balance of it for sure. Yeah. Uh, that's I will... the same for the industry. The industry has got to stop gatekeeping and start, being transparent and talk to the consumers that dude that's literally my mission in what i do and talking with these yeah. things and people like you and Mueller and, and all of us i just want to help everything move forward and do better yeah because it's it's ironic how many people in the industry don't talk to each other a lot what's competition you know it's my competition can't talk can't. i'm friends with i'm friends with kink's brand manager right i mean you all should be I don't talk to him every day, but we definitely reach out to each other like once a month. How's everything going, man? It's not always about work. I yeah. talked, I talked to Robbie probably once a month for like an hour. You know, it's not uh, it's not always about competition. You know, sometimes Should it's just be. about like, this is a friend. This is another. This is a brother in BMX. You know, and they're calling me to bullshit, and that's what it should be about sometimes. You know. Yep, and just promoting what is good and what is cool because. You're going to get yep. a whole lot further promoting what is genuinely good and what is genuinely cool to you than you are being selective about what you'll talk about and what you'll what you'll support. You know, you know who's always been really, really good about that? And looking back, there probably wasn't a time where when I was 18, 19, where I wouldn't have realized this. But Albies has always flip has always been really, really good about just promoting what he's about and having fun on a bike. Yeah. You know, if you think about it, because he was it, Taj rode for him all the way to Daniel Deers. Look at those two different people. Tyler Fernagel, throw him in Ty, that yeah. list. Like, yeah, exactly. So it's like, look, you know, um, 
so it's just one of those things like I, you know, give flip props for that. It's like it's always been, no, this is who we are, you yep. know. Pusher does that. You watch one of their videos, you know they're camping. Like they're going camping mm-hmm. and riding bikes, you know. So I think you're right. It's about showing who you really are, showing true face and having fun. Yes. With that being said, before you got to go eat dinner, yeah. I want to know if there's anything new and exciting coming out that you can talk about. Yeah, I can talk about everything. Um, oh, okay, don't go crazy <laughs> here. I want you to get in trouble. Luckily, I got a bunch, luckily I got a bunch of new stuff. Um, Let's promote with, it. Yeah, with Colin Baranyak, he has a new fork coming out Ooh. that I'm definitely stoked on it. It's uh, I believe it's a 15 millimeter offset off the top of my head. I'm just stoked on it because I've, I've probably done 15 different forks now, and this is the one I'm most happy with. As okay. far as the way it meets the headset to his head tube, it's a premium fork, but you put it on his Fiend frame and it looks like it belongs on the Fiend frame, nice. you know? And that's what I'm talking about when other brands should talk to each other. Like premiums, Auro might be a competitor of Fiend or whatever, mm-hmm. whatever you want to call it, but premium isn't. Right. Colin rides for both of us. Why wouldn't I try to design something that would look ideal on his bike setup? Um, that's coming out. Chad has a new fork coming out. That is an update of his old fork. That is definitely, I'm stoked on that for similar reasons as well. Um, the other stuff coming out is a bunch of new handlebars with bigger clamp sizes. I think BMXers need to realize 25.4 is the diameter a handlebar should be at the, at the stem bore. There's a big difference when you ride that, you know, everything else is Standard size would be 22.2, you know, whereas, you know, you look at dirt jumping mountain bike, they run 35. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a reason for that. And their stems are are dainty. You know, Chad's stem was slipping all the time. And right away when we were redoing his stem, I actually think back to Dak rides a larger clamp size. Yep. So this tie on E-Claw and Ty would always bitch about bar slippage. Well, Ty wrote a the bigger size and now they don't slip same with that and Hmm. when you know dakota might not be the pickiest person about his bike setup but i've definitely been on enough cinema trips to know i've never seen him fix his handlebars and i've seen a lot of people slamming their bars against walls interesting so you know like that's one thing i'm really stoked that came out um there's a inverted colin stem that's coming out that i'm pretty stoked on so Basically, it's meant to run upside down or right side up. I mean, you can do that on any stem. The only difference is is that his has a little adapter, so that way the compression cap sits flush. Oh, okay. And kind of the reasoning for doing that is um, Colin's kind of the same way. I hate headset spacers. It shouldn't. Headset spacers look like shit. Nobody really bends their forks there, but it's technically not as stiff. Mm -hmm. It's technically not the way you'd want to do it. So why wouldn't you make a stem that has two different feasible and good rises, whether it's upside down or right side up? Interesting. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So just little stuff like that. Um, I don't know. As horrible as it sounds, there's a commuter e-bike that I've been working on for way too long that just technically was very challenging to me and now it works. So I'm actually, you know, I'm stoked on that myself. You know, it's not the BMX thing, but I'm just excited because it was a challenge. Mm-hmm. you know but yeah we've got a bunch of new stuff coming out really in the next six months a lot of premium stuff's going to be trickling out uh there's a new ck slick tire in a new tread pattern in a wider size um we just dropped a bike with dennis called the clunkerson which is oh i saw that yeah i am you know S and M did like the COVID nineteen cruiser. It's kind of the same thing, right? Like clunkers are the start of mountain bikes, but really what they are is BMX. They're beach cruisers with BMX parts on them, and people would just bomb them down a hill. Mm-hmm. And if you know, you look at any of those old videos, it's just a bunch of dudes that look like a bunch of BMXers having fun, having a beer, crashing down a dirt hill. So when I reached out to Dennis, I reached out to Chad first and was like. Would you be into a wheelie bike? Well, when I reached out to Dennis, I knew it wasn't necessarily going to be a wheelie bike. Mm -hmm. And I asked him what I want to do a lifestyle bike with you. What would you like? And he's like, dude, I want a bike that I can bomb down a hill, but then I can also ride with 
the chick and the baby down to the farmer's market. And I'm like, cool, I finally get to make a clunker. Nice. You know, so I'm stoked on that. That's something I did the artwork for on that myself. Um, so that's always fun to be able to actually make the time to draw up everything and do it all. So, yeah, I don't know. There's a bunch of new stuff. It's just all I think what you're going to see from a lot of people is we have all this inventory. So we have to tr be, we have to trickle in what we have. Right. You know, so what I kind of started doing nine months ago when this all started, the pile up obvious was obviously happening was I slowed down certain projects. Right. I didn't cancel orders, but instead of Chad's new stem coming out four months ago, I slated it for this before Christmas. I'd rather it come out in spring, you know, because I have an, I have Chad stems. I need to sell what we have. They're still good stems. Mm -hmm. You know, nothing's wrong with them. So I think a lot of companies you're going to see that from where they've had stuff in the works. And I know of a lot of comp companies I've worked for where the drawing's been done. The sample's yeah. been, you know, and then like I saw one the other day just get posted and I was like, oh, that's awesome. I totally forgot about that, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and it's just it's nice to see that that means that inventory is being sold down to me. You know, people do have space to bring stuff in. That's a positive outlook. Are yeah. there, uh, any videos coming soon that you guys have been working on? I'd have to ask Joey. But yeah, there is. OK. That's yeah, a good Joey, answer. Joey really focuses on when it comes to Haro. Um, I support Joey, but Joey really supports focuses on team management, marketing, and media. So Joey's out filming and shooting all the time. I know he's working with both Dennis and Chad on stuff. I don't know if it's more of a serious edit or if it's more of a couple minute piece. Mm -hmm. Lots of times with Haro, I know Joey had spoken to the team and asked him, for instance. Like, would you guys want to do more uh, three or four big long trips or more short, you know, three, four day trips? And to those dudes, they travel a lot already. So it's like they wanted to do one big trip like Columbia, then a couple small trips. Like, let's just drive five hours to Flagstaff. Yeah, there's 15 spots and two good skate parks, but it'll be fun. You know, so I think with us, there'll probably be a lot more than that. We just did that Paris thing. Um, I'm going to be working with nyquist on some park parts and i'm going to be working with paris on some paris things cool so the paris stuff i'm i'm excited to do because you know as she's grown as a person and a rider i think she's really became nothing but more bright mm -hmm. you know of a soul and an individual so i think it'll be fun to figure out a couple of the ideas artwork alone that she's already mentioned is amazing you know it just really speaks to her so i think that stuff is going to be cool to do. You know, it'll be her first. I, I could be wrong by this, but I think it would be the first true signature product where it's like, no, you have a blank slate. No, you don't have to use, say, say you know, lots of people, they'll try to consistently use the same dropout. Yeah. That makes sense because it makes the frame look like it's a company X frame. But each rider wants a different part, right? Like mm -hmm. Garrett's Fien head tube is not the same as Collins head to for okay. a reason. Collins, not Garrett. Garrett's not Colin, you know? It, so I think that'll be interesting to do with Paris and, you know, it'll be, we'll be able to explore some different stuff and Nyquist. I know he's going to push my ass on weight and <laughs> like that, you know, I have not that I don't ride skate parks. I love riding skate parks, probably more than street, especially these days. Cause I'm getting older, but I'm not the guy that wants to go out there and make the lightest frame. Yeah. But Nyquist, Nyquist is, and I will say Nyquist's prototype frame. Um, we had Michael Mulgaw on, on one for nine months, and Nyquist rode one for a year. Paris rode one for a year. A few other people rode one. It's the lightest frame on the market when it drops, unless somebody else beats me by little fractions. Damn. So that stuff, that's going to be probably a fall thing because – it uses certain tubing that's not easy to get. Yeah. But that stuff's nice, you know, having Nyquist push my boundaries and like, you know, I say push Nyquist does actually push, you know, like <laughs> he does tell you like, no, you know, we should do this. We should do that. Mm -hmm. Haro's going to work closer. A lot of people in the public might not know this, but the owner of Kenda, the people that own Kenda own part of Haro. 
and I'm not scared to say that. I, it's actually, I'm proud of it. We just need to use that resource more. Because right mm -hmm. now, and I'm sure Kenda wants the same thing, right? Because they're not known for their BMX tires, but they make good other tires. So they have the technology to make amazing BMX tires. So that's one of my big goals. And we've already worked with Chad on his new tire. So there's also folding samples coming in, which I believe in heavily because now the tire, you know, the tech in the KG folding tires that blow out, there's better technology in that that can be used. Yeah. And if you really can make the lightest tire that has the best feel and it doesn't blow out, it's worth the money. Yeah. I have experience with that just because when I was coming up riding and folding tires were first coming out and stuff, yeah. I tried them a couple times, Dude. blew them out, put holes in the sides. But now the tires I'm riding, uh, they, you riding the new Odysseys. No. Oh, I have the super, Those are super good. Yeah. I have the super circuit in the front and I've, I've, I like yeah. that tire, and then I have the uh, alienation tire in the back. That the, the back is the problem for me. There was the problem oh, for yeah. me. I have not had a single problem. Like there you go. I haven't put holes in that case. It, it's awesome, and it's yeah. super super light. So I'm interested in that. You know, like that to me, exploring that more is definitely something I'm thankful to have Kenda kind of at my beck and call to help me with that. Yeah. You know, because I don't. You start getting into that land, it's like you need somebody spent. <laughs> they know more than I do. Yeah, it's like a scientist. You know, that's exciting to me. You know, we have a Chad tire coming out. Colin will be getting a tire. Um, me and him, basically, because everything's been crazy, kind of, that's been like, okay, we're going to do it when we want to. Um, but I'll, Chad's got one coming already that will first drop in a standard wire bead. And then we, because I want to test the folding stuff to an insane amount. Mm -hmm. I have six different sidewall constructions coming to test. I really want to make sure I find what the best is and the best mixture. Same with the rubber compound on tires. I've been working with Kenda. A lot of people in BMX don't know this, but Odyssey tires definitely have a lot of rubber in them. Some tires have more plastic than rubber in them. Oh, interesting. So, so that's why they slip more maybe. Yes. Or, or maybe why one tire squeaks and one doesn't. Yeah. Um, you know, so the actual compound is something that I've learned from riding mountain bikes matters a shitload. You know, where I'm like, this is the same tread, but it doesn't hook in the corner the way the more expensive one does. And then you figure out, well, that's why this tire is 100 and this one's 30. Mm -hmm. you know? So that's something I want to explore too. Not that I think BMXers should spend more monies on tires, but if it really made a difference, Tires should be more money than what they are anyway. So why not make some that make a difference? You know, we're, people are starting to buy tubalitos left and right because BMXers are finally realizing that rolling resistance is – rolling weight is the number one weight to decrease. You feel it more than anything. Yeah, I've heard that. So, you know, the, the tire thing is definitely one that I'm excited to explore more. Cool, man. That's, that's... No tube with tires, though. I don't know about that one just yet. <laughs> I mean, Alienation's been Have doing you it tried for... them? I haven't personally tried it, but it seems... I mean, they still do it, so... It's, yeah. It seems like it works. And from the people I've heard from, I've heard good things, so I, I don't know. I don't it's have... a weird one to me, right? Because so I still hear water being boiled, so I'm safe. Okay. But... um. <laughs> It's a weird one to me because if I had it this way, a large purpose of it is technically you never get a flat. Yeah. You're not you pinch flat. That's amazing. No yeah. flat, you pinch flat. If you run over a nail, you can plug those tires just like you would plug a car tire, right? Right there on the spot, spin it, pump it back up. But the other thing is you can run lower tire pressure, mm -hmm. which is amazing for street riding. But if you do a 180 and land at a 90, 90 and that bead breaks off the, the rim, psh, you're done. You're going home. Yeah. You can't, you can't yeah. reset a tubeless tire without a compressor. Oh, I see. Or a CO2 or, a, or, a, or the right type of CO2 pump, pump, you know, cartridge. You see the little cartridges at the bike shops? Mm -hmm. Those are just CO2, you know, so it's faster. So I do see some problems there that have kept me from playing with it more because 
you know how many times I've seen someone try to do a hard three and land like completely screwed where the tire would definitely come right off the rim and then you're destroying a rim too. Yeah. Because yeah. on concrete, you know, we're not in the dirt. Right. I guess that's why those tires and rims lock so well together. Like they, yeah. the beads are crazy locked in on those tires. Well, it's also, I would have to, I would have to look, but I believe that tires is tubeless and non tubeless. So it's that, yeah. that becomes a little different, you know, like a lot of high end rims in other industries that are tubeless. There's not, you don't see that bead. There's, there's no hook. Oh, okay. You don't necessarily need that. That's extra weight. Gotcha. <laughs> you don't always need that. So, you know, if you were really going to go full pull on tubeless, you would really do it right and do it that way. But I understand. I, I'm stoked that Alienation does it. And I have been curious because, you know, I don't spec Alienation rims right now, but I do talk to Alienation and mm -hmm. we, I might be specking some of their rims in the future. So it's one thing I've thought about telling him, like, hey, dude, can you just send me a rim and a tire? I just personally want to go do a bunch of 90s and land sideways because it could potentially be somewhere that went somewhere. Yeah. Some went somewhere. Zach is such a good dude. I love yeah, talking to him. Yeah, he's super nice. He's straightforward, too. When he hit me up, I was, man, I'm sure you know who I use, and I'm sure you know they're good rims, and they last, and, you know, he knows. But Alienation, you know. I feel like that's one brand that's done a lot of this in BMX, so it's it's good to see that the last couple of years it's been like an even balance, you know? Yeah, there's been, I mean, from personal experience, there's been just constant and consistent like work on stuff that is just as good as it can possibly be and consistently releasing it. And that's what, that's what uh, you know, that's what you have to do. I've probably said it to you before, and I've probably said it to other people, but one thing I've learned from watching Garrett, Nathan, really especially Garrett, really everybody, uh, the certain pros at that higher level, all the cinema dudes, is if the trick's not right, it's not right. Just do clips. Like, the amount of clips that I've seen or the amount of attempts I've seen after a pull are mind-blowing. Oh. That's why there's video footage where, That's why there's video footage where I have the photo but I'm not in the video. Tony mm. Ennis isn't deleting me out. He doesn't have time to do all that. It just happened that Garrett pulled it two hours before he pulled the one that he deemed 100% perfect. And, you know, with Fiend, he would always be like, well, if it's right, it's right. If it's not, then it's definitely wrong. And you're like, that's something that I've tried to take. I, I plan on taking even more into Haro, where it's like, no, I won't. I will not accept this. Yeah. You know, because when you can complete bikes, you get weird things, you know, like I've had bikes come in with the wrong grips on them before. I'm like, how did you this? What are you doing? <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, but it, so it's like it's one of those things that's, you know, we need to all take that into consideration. And if it like you said, they keep doing things and trying harder and harder and harder. It's like that's really what you have to do. Mm -hmm. You keep doing it until it's right. Yep. And then you go enjoy your day, you know, and if it's not right, then you need to just tell that filmer to delete that shit <laughs> yeah or i mean i got photos that i got photos that people don't love or i don't love so they'll never see the light of day uh, like they're just buried and labeled red on a hard drive because in 30 years i might want to look at them you know yep and products should be the same way and <clears throat> through my experience with alienation stuff there's stuff that just has like it it doesn't come out right away because it's got to get refined exactly. to the point where it's right where it's right and that's and you know that's one thing you know bring it back to you asked what i was looking forward to that was my train of thought was that's what i'm looking forward to is that right now because of covid a lot of the stuff i've designed or done hasn't came out yet some of it because there's just so many delays it hasn't but a lot of it hasn't seen the light of day right like mm -hmm. my my 22 line some of them came out but most of them converted to 23s but I never got to drop a co cohesive how it should, oh, how yeah. it really should have dropped, you know? So now I'm looking forward to the samples I just ordered coming in because that then when those come out, it'll be mine. It'll be not mine. It'll be my time period in Haro. Some mm -hmm. of them I worked on with John Bulgins. A lot of them I did. But, you know, then I'll be able to say I did this, you know, whereas now it's not that I dislike them. But there's little things, you know, 
bikes that still have a might still have a 74.5 head tube angle but a free coaster and you're like well that just the math doesn't the math <laughs> added up on that seven years ago but now it you know so i'm excited to see all the things come into fruition that i've done you know i'm sure you know from doing some things with alien nation you know you if you tell them you like a seat material and the seat comes in the mail you're like oh i'm freaking stoked like samples are the best Dude. you know it's like christmas I'm going to tell you there's one on yeah, my see. bike that I get the, hopefully the PO has gone through because it's the beginning of the year. I cannot wait to talk about this thing yeah, because see, I was intimately involved where it was like, this was yeah. my idea from the very beginning. I wanted to make the best of it that we could possibly do. And that's exactly what we did. See, and that's what that that really is all what it's about, like bringing the Clunkerson back up. Like when we went, Dennis, I think Joey just dropped the video for that. But anyway, when we put that when we did that video, Dennis, at the end of the day, texted me. He's like, shit, man, that was a lot of fun. That was actually worth not riding BMX all day today. And I was like that that not riding the BMX isn't what got me. But the point that he thanked me that that was a lot of fun is what really got me. I'm like, fuck, man, this is what it's all about, is making bikes, making fun parts and bikes with the homies Absolutely. that hopefully other people can enjoy. And hopefully people buy, because if not, then, you know, I'll be living in the garage. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, man, well, I don't want to keep you from dinner, so. Don't, it should be done. But if you, if, if you, anybody listening has any jams coming up, email me it's not that hard of an email address to figure out it's just kevin at haro bikes boom just shoot me an email you know because to me it's like haro might not be able to give you a bunch of money for your jam but i know we i know joey will send you some grips and t-shirts to throw out at least i know we can support it you know and that's what it is to me it's like no matter what company you are you can find an old pair of grips or you can find something and you can pay the ten dollars straight to get it there it's not a big deal there you go. So and I agree fully. But, so where can yep. people see well, the stuff that you just talked about coming out? On Haro BMX Instagram and then on Premium BMX and Instagram. And then I, I'll share stuff in my stories. I need to be better about that. I look at like plastic molds and stuff all the time and I'm like, I should just post a photo of this. Like Neil, Neil at Colt's good at that. He'll post like, some stuff he's working on that he's amped on you know but um yeah just look at the haro instagram that's where it always first drop is haro or premium and then you're just kevin connors on instagram yep you got your Simple name was that all right man well i appreciate your time i appreciate everybody all tuning right. in and uh and thanks for thanks for repping the short the shirt boom next time uh, we'll what talk I, about that yeah <laughs> Yep, next time we will. It's a famous <laughs> sign in San Diego. <laughs> That's funny. All, All right. right, boss. Have a good one. Have a good one. Thank you.